Hey, good morning, Monte Vista Chapel, and welcome to Sunday. Uh, we are glad that you are here, and if you're joining us out in the courtyard or whether you are joining us at your homes or wherever you are joining us, we are glad that you are here and with us this morning. Um, I just want to invite you to participate. Jump in, join in, sing uh, loud. Uh, if giving is a part of your Sunday worship, I encourage you to do that as well. Um, pray with us and be present. And our present being present is what's really, really important um, because we're present to what is. We're present to what is going on in our homes, how school is getting started with what's going on in our families. We're present to um, where we're listening to the message this morning and what God might want to reveal and say to us. And so I ask you to be present. Um, but in being present, there's this invitation. Uh, there's an invitation, it feels like, to uh, just speak into and pray over um, our schools and our students and our teachers and our educators and anyone who is um, involved in that realm. Uh, I just want to take a quick minute as school has gotten started and just speak to you. So I'm going to do something that we don't often do, although if we were gathered together, I would ask you to do this. But if you're a teacher, an educator, a dean, an administrative uh, person, if you're a student or a, a parent teacher, right? Even if you consider yourself a lifelong learner, I want to ask you to stand up where you're at. I want you to stand up in your living room, in your homes, out in the courtyard, wherever you're at, because um, I want to pray a blessing over you. But first, um, we kind of need to just lament. We lament because school is not starting the way that we want to, but we don't just lament to get our emotions out. We do it to be able just to own our desires and our emotions. And we do that so that we can actually release that to the Lord. And we release those to the Lord that we might actually receive his blessing in this time. So as you stand, I want to just pray. Pray with me. Father, in this time uh, of school getting started in ways that are probably not our first choice, um, we lament. We say this is hard. We say it's not our desire. Um, it's not our first choice. And yet you are a God who's with us. You say you can handle those hard emotions, and we know that you stand with us and our students and our teachers. And for that, we're super grateful. But... Genesis 50, 20 reminds us, God, that what Satan intends to harm us, what Satan intends to frustrate us, depress us, to keep us down, God, that you can use for your glory and for your good. So, Father, for teachers and, and administrators, may God grant you a strong connections with your students online. May he grant you with the creative mind to foster that connection in new and innovative ways. Surprise yourself. And for parents, um, May God give patience and stamina as you do the work of sitting with your children for school. May God bless you with the joys of teaching that come when new concepts are learned or light bulbs go off in our students and in our children. And for you students, whether you're a preschooler, whether you're going to college, or whether you're in grad school, may God grant you a strong reminder that you are not just your school. That as God's children, you've been given every tool to learn and grow. And Lord, surprise them with the gift that they are more capable and gifted than they are often given credit for. Suppress frustration, depression, and the mundane and birth curiosity and courage and joy in their learning. And so God, while we confess this morning and in this season that school may not be exactly what we desire, we also believe, God, that you transcend school walls just like you transcend church walls. Surprise us with your joy in the midst of um, our learning. I pray this, Lord, and turn us to worship you this morning in the power of your son's name. Amen. shepherd is whose goodness faileth never I nothing lack if I am his and he is mine forever and he is mine forever my streams of living water flow i 
as we come today carrying all that we are and all that we feel. Those of us who feel anxious from all of the change that we are have experienced or are about to experience, Lord, I pray and ask that you would settle our spirits. Help your peace fall fresh on us. For those of us who feel alone and isolated during this time, I pray and ask that a fresh awareness of your presence would fall on us. That in our comings and goings and everything we do during the day, Lord, that we would feel you there with us. In times of difficulty, we would turn to you. God, I pray and ask that you would remind us who we are in you. And help us to seek to praise you in everything we do.
That is our prayer today, that we would be able to rest our weary souls in you. God, we look forward uh, to the day where more and more um, your kingdom is coming and your will is being done and we are able to say uh, with all of God's people, holy, holy is the king of kings. And God, we know that you have invited us into that mission that brings that reality about. We're grateful for your son, Jesus, who has made that possible. And God, um, as we open up scripture today and look at what you are inviting us and calling us to as your people, Father, I pray that you would give me words to say. I pray that you would give everyone who's listening, uh, wherever we are, ears to listen. Holy Spirit, would you move in our hearts? Would you bind us and unite us together as a common people with a common purpose? God, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, welcome, wherever you are, uh, wherever you're joining us from, whether that's 
in the courtyard, whether it is in the Turlock or outlying areas, or whether it's all over the world, uh, it is good to be together today. And today is Vision Sunday. Now, that's usually the time where students are returning to school and where church ministries are beginning to pick back up from their summer lull. Uh, but the reality is it's a different season. It's a different year. Uh, that's uh, to say the least. I mean, for the most part, students aren't returning to school. Instead, parents are trying to help them engage in online classes, and teachers are trying to figure out how to teach those online classes, and it is disrupting for everyone. Uh, we're just in a season of tremendous disruption. And then if you turn on the news, you see that the political strife is more and more polarizing every single day, and I think it's going to continue to ramp up. Many uh, in our community and throughout the nation and world are experiencing financial and economic uncertainty. Racial tensions we see are still uh, high. And then there's uh, frustration and fear that seems to be at a boiling point because of the uncertainty of, of how we are to respond to this COVID-19 virus. And all over the world, there is unrest. And then to top all of that off, we as a local church along with every other organization like us, we're not able to gather together the way that we're accustomed to. So I want to begin this Vision Sunday by acknowledging that we're in a difficult spot. Like Eric said, it's unsettling, it's undoing. Um, and, and I just want to acknowledge the times that we're in. But I also want to say I think that it's because we are in these times that the message that we're going to be looking at this morning is so important. Because in the midst of all of the unsettled realities that we're in and that are going on around us, we cannot lose sight of the fact that God is on a mission. That's the first point I want to drive home. God is on a mission. In fact, he has been on that mission from the time he created the world and put Adam and Eve in it and told them to be fruitful and multiply, to fill the earth and to subdue it, uh, to rule over the world, to bring it under God's good and just and loving leadership. And we see throughout scripture that time and time again, God's people, they would lose sight of that mission. And they would drift off and things would get sideways and messed up for them. So God in his grace and his love would send somebody to remind them of that mission and to get them back on track again. And one such time was when the Israelites as a nation, they were in a really difficult season like us. In fact, it was a bit worse than ours. You see, they were in captivity and they were in a season with tremendous political un, uh, instability. Um, there were the Persians and Babylonians and the Assyrian empires warring, and they were pawns in the middle of it. It, it was a mess for them. Uh, they were experiencing great economic uncertainty, like many of you are. The racial tensions uh, were high, only there it was directed primarily against them as Israelites, as Jewish people. And just like us, because they were in captivity, they were not able to gather to worship the way that they would like to. Like us, they were in unsettling times. And like us, many of them were in this place where they were beginning to lose hope. They were beginning to be discouraged. And they were beginning to just sort of drift off track and lose their way. So God sent the prophet Isaiah to remind them that even in the midst of all of this unrest, that God was still moving, that God was still on mission. So I want to read the words from the prophet Isaiah found in Isaiah chapter 61. Here Isaiah says, The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me, because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. So imagine what it must have been like for them to hear that, because that's who they were. They were the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of God's recompense, to comfort all who mourn 
and to provide for all those who grieve, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. And they will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. And they will rebuild ancient ruins and they'll restore places long devastated. They will renew the ruined cities that have been devastated for generations. Strangers will shepherd their flocks and foreigners will work their fields and vineyards. And you will be called priests of the Lord, ambassadors of God. You will be named ministers of our God. You will feed on the wealth of nations and in their riches you will boast. Instead of your shame, you will receive a double portion and instead of disgrace, you will rejoice in your inheritance. And so you will inherit a double portion in your land and everlasting joy will be yours. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrongdoing. In my faithfulness, I will reward my people and make an everlasting covenant with them. Their descendants will be known among the nations and their offspring among the peoples. And all them, all who see them will acknowledge that they are a people that the Lord has blessed. Friends, we need to hear this clearly. God's mission is to redeem and restore a broken world. God's mission is to redeem and to restore a broken world. It's not just to save us and bring us to heaven so we can somehow leave this mess behind. That is not a biblical gospel. That is not the mission of God revealed through scripture. God's mission is to restore this world, to move us towards a day when Christ returns and heaven and earth comes together and all will be new. Friends, God's mission is to bring shalom. Now, you may not be familiar with that term. I use it quite often, um, but I know that if you're not familiar with the term, I guarantee you're familiar with the longing for it because all of us long for shalom. You see, shalom is a Jewish concept and it is deeply, deeply rooted in this mission of God. It's the word that the Israelites would reach for. It's the word that the Israelites would use uh, to express their longing for everything to be set right in a broken world. Shalom is anchored in the God-centered relationship between people and between the places they live and the things that they do. Shalom is the interconnectedness that all of us long for. Like when you're lonely, that longing for connectedness, that's the longing for shalom. Shalom is the proper relationship between God, between us as humanity, between the world and the creation that we live in and the work that we do. The word shalom, it points to this sense of acceptance and unity and peace and absolute flourishing of the created order that God originally intended. In short, shalom is the way things are meant to be. Shalom is the way we were meant to be. It's that space where we can say together with Julian of Norwich, and all shall be well, and all shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well. So I want to ask, do you feel the longing for shalom? because it's especially pronounced in a season where things are very clearly not as they are intended to be. I felt it this past week as the elders gathered to pray for a young couple who are struggling with infertility and they long to have a child and I could feel the whole group was longing for shalom. I, I feel it as I interact with parents um, I mean, my wife and I, we're at the place where our children are not in school anymore. And so as I listen to parents who are trying to figure out how to work and then how to care for their children and help them with their online classes, all at the same time trying to bring some sort of normalcy to the home, and I feel this longing that they have, it, it's a longing for shalom. 
I feel it amidst the fear and the frustration around COVID and the desire for things to, to uh, get back to some sense of normal. It's a longing for shalom. I feel it in the protests um, and the, the confusing conversations about race as we, we long to make right that which is broken. That's a longing for shalom. It's even laced in our political conversations as people advocate for which person they think is going to best be able to make things right in our nation. And that is simply, friends, it is a longing for shalom. So, so do you feel it? Like, I, want, I don't want you to repress it. I don't want you to push it down. I want to allow it, let you allow it, invite you to allow it to come to the surface. Do you feel the longing? Because what you are longing for, friends, that is the mission of God. It is to restore a broken world. It is to bring shalom. And friends, God has provided a way to bring that shalom, and it's through Jesus so the second point I want to make real clear here is that Jesus embodies the mission. Jesus embodies the mission of God. He is the one that God chose not only to proclaim that mission so clearly, but also to model it so we understand what a life of shalom looks like, and then also to give his life in order that God's mission to restore a broken world could be fulfilled. Jesus was, and he still is, the one who embodies the mission of God. And so I want you to listen to um, the words that he spoke in Luke chapter 4, verses 16 to 21. These are words that Jesus spoke um, right when he began his ministry. And I want you to notice what he is quoting here. He's reaching back to the passage in Isaiah that we just read. Jesus went to Nazareth uh, where he had been brought up and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue as was his custom. He stood up to read and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Now go figure that. Unrolling it he found the place where it was written. So he rolls back to Isaiah 61 and he says this, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began by saying to them, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. I don't think sometimes we really understand what's going on here, but we need to realize that this is the biggest mic drop moment of all history. Because here, Jesus, again, is speaking to God's people, the Israelites, the Jewish people, and he's speaking to them 600 years after he had reminded them of his mission through the prophet Isaiah when they were in captivity and they were longing for shalom. And do you know where God's people are again? Yeah, they are once again in captivity. Only this time, um, they're not in captivity to the Babylonians or Assyrians. They're in captivity to the Roman Empire. And once again, they were experiencing tremendous political strife. There was all sorts of economic uncertainty. There was racial tension. There was religious un, uh, infighting. And just like you and I are today in the midst of our circumstances, they were longing for shalom. They had a deep longing for things to be restored. And then Jesus who is God wrapped in the flesh and blood of humanity, he enters into this brokenness. He leaves the glory and splendor of heaven and out of grace and love enters this broken world and he begins his ministry by reminding everyone that God has not lost sight of the mission that he began uh, at the creation of the world. He has not lost sight of his mission to bring shalom. And the way Jesus does that is, like I said, by bringing them back to the prophet Isaiah, who reminded them 600 years ago that God is moving. And because God is moving, Jesus said it means some really good news. 
It's good news for the poor. He said it means freedom for the prisoner, recovery of sight for the blind. That's physical and spiritual. It means freedom from oppression, and it means that there is a new season of God's favor and acceptance for all people. Friends, that is the good news. Like that is the gospel. And the mic drop moment is when Jesus sits down because in the Jewish culture, that was the place of authority. So Jesus sits down and with authority, he says today, right here and right now, the mission of God, the one that, that began at creation, the one that shows up again and again and again in scripture, the one that the, that the prophet Isaiah proclaimed to the people in captivity, that mission is being fulfilled here in this moment. You see, Jesus says in no uncertain terms, I I, I am the one who will bring not just you, but all of humanity, the shalom that you have been longing for ever since creation. Boom. And friends, Jesus brings that shalom in several ways. First, uh, because Jesus is both God and fully man, uh, his death and resurrection restores our relationship to God. And I know that's a simplistic statement and there's so much packed into it. Uh, but my point here is that a restored relationship with God that Jesus makes possible through his death and resurrection, it is the foundation upon which God's mission is built. You see, shalom is not possible without a connection with God. On our own, we do not have the love or the grace or the forgiveness, the wisdom or the courage to make life uh, work the way that it is intended to. On our own, we actually vandalize shalom instead of create it. In fact, that is what sin is defined as. Sin is defined as the vandalism or the destruction of God's shalom. But because of Jesus, sin is exposed as the death-inducing lie that it is, and our relationship with God is restored so that God's love and his grace and his mercy, his forgiveness, his wisdom and courage can flow to us and through us because we are now connected to him. So Jesus brings God's mission forward of shalom by first restoring our relationship with God. That is of the utmost importance. But second, Jesus brings this mission of shalom and makes it possible by modeling a life of shalom. Friends, if you are wondering what kind of life we are called and created to live, look no farther than the person of Jesus. I mean, just notice, notice how he treated women in his day who were second class citizens and he includes them as his disciples. And in so doing, he's giving away his power and he's elevating them. Notice how he uses those who, relate, who are racially oppressed as the hero of his story in the Good Samaritan. Notice how he feeds the poor. Notice how he touches the outcast. And notice also what he taught his followers. He taught them to love their enemies and to, to pray for those who are against them, not to turn around and be against them in return. He told them to give to those who are in need. He told them to release their worries about their economic situation to a God who is known to provide for the birds of the air and the lilies of the field. And more than anything, friends, he modeled what it is to lay down his rights for the good of others even when laying down those rights, would cost him his very life. Friends, Jesus modeled what a restored life looks like. So if you're on mission and you want to live this life, we, we see it in the model and teachings of Jesus. So Jesus brings shalom by restoring our relationship with God, by modeling what shalom looks like, and finally, he brings shalom by sending his spirit so we don't have to go this alone. Friends, the same Jesus, we need to get this, the same Jesus who modeled and was able to live this life, who was connected fully to the Father so that he could receive the Father's love and grace. So he could, that Jesus is living inside of us through his Holy Spirit, and he will release to us all of the resources we need to live on mission, to live this life of shalom that Jesus made possible and modeled for us. So friends, God is on a mission Jesus embodies that mission. He's the one who made that mission possible. But hear this clearly. 
Uh, God's mission does not end with Jesus. And I think sometimes we as a church, we're guilty of that. Like we stop the mission at Jesus and then we skip over and we're waiting for him to return at some point. But the biblical gospel, it does not stop with Jesus. You see, the mission is now entrusted to the church. And that's the last point I wanna make. The church, that's you and me, the church is the instrument of the mission of God. The church is the instrument of the mission of God. Listen to what Jesus says right after his resurrection and before he returns to heaven. And Jesus says, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. Pretty straightforward. Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, hey, I am sending you. Friends, it doesn't get any clearer than this. God is on a mission to bring shalom into this broken world. And to accomplish that mission, he sends Jesus into that world, not only to model it, but through his death and resurrection to connect us to God in order to make that possible. And now Jesus sends you and me, his church, filled with the Holy Spirit out into the world to do the same. Friends, what we are as a church, what we are called to do and to be is to be ambassadors of God's shalom. That's what the Apostle Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 5. In verse 20, he says, we are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. We are God's ambassadors as though he's making this appeal through us. Hear this clearly, church. We are God's plan A for bringing shalom and restoration into this broken world, and there is no plan B, which then leads us to a very important question, and that is how do we actually do it? Like in, in real practical terms, how do we take this missional baton to bring shalom that was started by God, that was handed to Jesus, and now it's given to us, how do we take that baton and actually carry the mission forward? Well, there's a couple of things that I think we need to be real practical about. The first one is this. We as a church must have a clear vision and mission ourselves. We need to have a very clear mission and vision ourselves, and that uh, vision and mission must line up with the vision and mission of God. And I believe we do. What's really ironic about this is the day before, the week of COVID, when everything shut down back in March, the staff was gathered right over in the South Education Building, and we'd been part of a couple of day process that started uh, a year ago where we've been processing and listening to God and to people in the congregation and just asking questions about God, where are you inviting us to go? What are you inviting us to in this next season? And one thing that became abundantly clear was that while we had an intuition of what it was God is invi inviting us to do, we had not been very articulate about that vision. And on March 11, the day before things shut down, that vision became very clear for us. And for those who were involved in that and sitting in that room, it was really kind of a bit of a holy moment where uh, conversation and scripture and prayer kind of all worked together. And all of a sudden we went, oh yeah, okay, this is, this is it. And the way we've chosen to articulate that vision is this way. We desire that our world would experience the hope and freedom that is ours through Christ. Pretty straightforward. We desire that our world, the world that we can touch, we desire that our world would experience the hope and freedom, that's the shalom, that is ours through Christ. In other words, we want to be God's ambassadors of shalom. We desire that our world would experience the hope and freedom that is ours because of Christ. That's our vision. And our mission, the way we carry it out, that is Christ in us and Christ through us. And you've heard that phrase many times. In other words, as I've said before already this morning, we cannot be ambassadors of God's shalom if we first do not receive it from God. We cannot be agents of salvation, of love, of truth, of grace, of wisdom, unless we first receive it from God. So our mission as a church is, is crystal clear. 
it's crystal clear. We desire that our world would experience the hope and freedom that is ours through Christ. And the way we bring that freedom into the world is empowered by the Holy Spirit. We live a life of Christ in us and Christ through us. So our, our vision and our mission is clear. But we need more than just a mission and a vision. Second, if we're gonna join God in his mission to bring shalom to a broken world, we need to let go of the things that we cannot change. We need to let go of the things we cannot change. And friends, there are a lot of things that we cannot change in our current season. And it's frustrating for so many of us because we're used to, be able, we're used to being able to bend our environment, but we just can't do it. See, bottom line, here's the deal. I can't change Washington, D.C., I cannot affect the national race uh, conversations. I cannot change how COVID is being handled in the United States or in the state. I cannot affect our national economy. Now that, please understand, doesn't mean that I don't vote, that I don't engage in local racial reconciliation, that I don't wear a mask, that I don't contribute, that I don't do what I'm called to do. But here is a loving rebuke from your pastor. Friends, far too many Christians are, fen- are spending far too much emotional and physical energy fussing about the things that they cannot change. And it's happening at the cost of the things that God is actually calling us to change. You see, those big things out there that we can't change, we, those are God, that's God's deal. And God will do the work that God wants to do. Our job is to step into the things that we can actually get our hands on. You see, we only have so much time and energy. And when we spend that time and energy fussing about things, whether it's on social media or ranting with our friends about something that we disagree with, when we expend that, that limited time and energy on things that we cannot change, we don't have any more time and energy to actually get about the things that God has called us and invited us to change. As activist and teacher and scholar Margaret Wheatley said, we cannot change the way the world is, but we can create little islands of sanity. Friends, as a local church, Monta Vista Chapel, we cannot change the way that the world is, but empowered by the Holy Spirit, we can create little islands or little communities of shalom. That's actually what God is calling us to do. That is what it means to be on mission with God. So if we're gonna practically join God in his mission to bring shalom to a broken world as a church, we need to have a clear vision and mission. We need to let go of the things that we cannot change. And finally, we must partner with a few others who are on mission with us. We need to partner with a few others who are on mission with us. At the town hall meeting a month ago, I began to talk a little bit about the idea of third spaces. Now, you're going to hear that term more and more, and it's not a new term. It's actually a term from the mission movement. Um, But it's the idea of a group of like-minded Christ followers who simply gather to pray, to listen, and to act. Pretty straightforward. It's a group of like-minded Christ followers who gather to pray, and to listen, and then to act. And the goal of all of that is to join God's mission by creating this little island or this little community of shalom. And the truth is, the good news is, there's a few of those little islands of shalom, those third spaces already happening. There's one group who gathers on Tuesday nights, I think it is, to play jazz on their front lawn and it just started with a little group and it's gotten bigger and bigger. And not only those who are passing by now, grabbing their lawn chairs and hanging out for a while uh, and listening to music, but they're also beginning to be curious and they're stepping in for prayer and they're also bringing um, uh, perishable goods to contribute to a local food bank. And so what's happening is here in this uh, jazz community thing, like God is building a little island of shalom, a little community of shalom, and God's mission is moving forward. Another one is considering reopening a Bible club where the kids who are already together in the neighborhood are gonna be able to just get together once in a while to go through uh, scripture and, and learn about the story of God. 
And how cool would that be for parents to be able to have a little bit of break uh, from their kids? And how cool would that be for the kids? And so as that happens, this little island of shalom begins. This little community of shalom starts. And then the kingdom of God, or the mission of God, excuse me, advances. One family's providing space for college and young adults to gather in a safe way, to allow them to have some fun, as well as to process the unique stage of life that they're in and how God fits into it and and where God is inviting them to. And as they do that, another little island, another little community of shalom is created and God's mission moves forward. And there are more that I don't even know about. So here's what we're gonna do. Here's where it gets really practical. If you have already or you want to enter an ongoing discussion about finding a group of Jesus followers who will pray and listen and act, who will intentionally build these little islands or communities of shalom and advance God's mission, I just want you to email me. Email me or Nancy Rapp, and you can find that on our website. Mine is Ken V at monavistachapel.org. And Nancy's is the same thing, except it's Nancy R. Um, And you can uh, just say, hey, I want to join the mission, or I'm in, or hey, I'm interested, whatever. We'll know what that is. And then in a couple of weeks, as we gather those people together, we'll get together on Zoom or in person or a hybrid of those, depending upon where things are in our community. And we're going to go through some training. We're going to go through some brainstorming and some connecting with other like-minded people so you can practically step into God's mission. And while I don't know what the outcome of it will be, I don't. I do know, I'm very confident that this is what God has been calling us to. That's why we've done the education work so people can know the story. That's why we've done the formation and are doing the formation work so that people can become the kind of people who can bring Jesus into their community. All of it's pointing to this season Um, where God has prepared us to join him on mission, to join his mission made possible by Jesus and entrusted to us as a church. And before I go, it's been in the back of my head as I've been preaching, so it's not in my notes, but it's just been rattling around, so I'm just gonna speak to it a moment. I want us to end uh, by reflecting just a moment on a parable that Jesus told Um, one of the last parables that he told. It was in Matthew 25. And uh, in that parable, Jesus says, there's a day that's gonna come. And he says, I'm gonna come back. And uh, I'm I'm gonna look at the group of people who are on the earth. And they're gonna be naturally divided into two groups. And one group is those who have been on mission. They're the ones who've been visiting the prisoners. They're the ones who've been feeding the poor and clothing those. They've been on mission to bring uh, shalom and restore this broken world. And Jesus is gonna say to that group of people, hey, come on with me. We're gonna continue that mission for eternity and it is gonna be the best eternity you could ever possibly imagine. Like you thought it was good on earth, wait till heaven and earth come together. It is gonna be amazing. But then that other group, He's going to say to them, you know what, you're not interested in this, so this thing that I'm doing is is just not going to be great. And so the most loving thing he can do is do what he's done to the Israelites and to others, to us, and just say, okay, you can go your own way. And we know what that way is. It's separation from God, and uh, there's nothing good about that. So friends, the reason I say that is not to manipulate, it's not to pressure, but it's to help us remember church. I mean, I'm talking to you, the church, us, me, the church, to remember that this mission of God is not optional. It is central to what God has invited us to. And so if uh, you hear God inviting you, if you're wrestling with something, if there's an irritant going on inside, if you still feel resistant, I would suggest all of those are the Holy Spirit kind of poking at you saying, you need to check this out. You need to step into this. And so I invite you to do do that. Again, send me an email, send Nancy an email, and we're going to just get a community of people together to begin to work through this and see what God might do as we join him on that mission. So I'm gonna go ahead and close in a word of prayer. God, we are so grateful that you are on mission because man, we lose sight of it quickly. 
Thank you for the reminders of that mission all through scripture and ultimately thank you for Jesus who came to make that mission possible by restoring us to a relationship with you, by modeling the kind of life we're called to live, the shalom life, and then by filling us with the spirit and not leaving us alone but giving us all the resources we need to live that out. So Father, I pray that we might join like-minded people. And by like-minded, I don't mean we think the same about all things, but we are like-minded about the mission of God, that we will join and that we will pray, that we will listen and we will act with the hope of bringing your shalom, your kingdom here to be on earth as it already exists in heaven. So Father, give us the strength, the insight, the wisdom, the courage to step out, even in the midst, and maybe especially in the midst of these difficult times. Father, we pray all of these things in the strong name of the living Jesus, who died and rose again to make this mission possible. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. I want to invite you to stand and receive the parting blessing. But before I give that parting blessing, I just want to let you know that next week as we kick off a new series, um, we're going to do communion, but we're going to do it in a little bit different way. We're going to have a drive-through communion, um, and that's going to be in the parking lot on Sunday night from 7 to 8 o'clock. There'll be a little bit of worship. You can come by and get the individually packaged worship, I mean, uh, uh, individually packaged communion elements. You can sit in your car and just be able to do that together. So it'll be a a sweet, sweet space. So let me uh, give us the blessing. So now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than we could ever ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work in us, to him be glory in the church, and in Christ Jesus. And all God's people said, amen.